Hello, and welcome to this session on occupational health at the 2020 virtual edition of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Chapter of the American College of Sports Medicine Conference. The title of our session is, If Sitting is the New Smoking, Can Sit-Stand Desks Be the Nicorette Fix? My name is Peter Hosick, and I'm an associate professor at Montclair State University in Montclair, New Jersey. I'm the first speaker in this session, and my talk will focus on what is known about ergonomic and cardiometabolic effects of prolonged occupational standing. Our next speaker is Dr. Bethany Barone Gibbs from the University of Pittsburgh to talk about similar effects of prolonged sitting. And finally, also from the University of Pittsburgh, we have Dr. April Chambers to discuss sit-stand desks and what is currently known about the effects they can have on health and wellness. I hope you enjoy. As I said, my name is Peter Hosick and I'm an associate professor at Montclair State University in the Department of Exercise Science and Physical Education. If you are not familiar with Montclair State, we are located in the northeast corner of New Jersey, approximately 12 miles west of New York City. We have a beautiful campus that includes lovely skyline views of New York City. The focus of my talk today is to discuss ergonomic and cardiometabolic effects of prolonged occupational standing in this talk entitled, Don't Stand All Day at Work. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I will hopefully convince you that standing is probably not the best practice if your goal is to combat sitting. My objectives today are to first, get you all to consider the implications of saying sitting is the new smoking, and the prevailing view that standing may be better. Second, I hope I am able to adequately demonstrate that there are some problems associated with prolonged standing and discuss what some of those are. And finally, I will discuss the effects that standing has on energy expenditure compared to sitting and whether prolonged standing is likely to be effective in weight loss efforts. So, as I said, let's first consider the statement, sitting is the new smoking. Now, I'm not exactly sure when this statement came about or where it came from, but let's do a side-by-side -side comparison of the major clinical outcomes or effects of each. On the left is a short list of chronic conditions highly associated with smoking. On the right is another list of issues associated with prolonged sitting. It shouldn't take long to see some differences. First, the smoking list is much longer. It's also not complete. And the second, while there is some overlap in the two lists, condi the conditions under smoking are generally much more severe than those in the sitting list. Now, I don't want to minimize the effects that prolonged sitting can have. And if you're interested in learning more about those, I urge you to check out the next presentation given by Dr. Barone Gibbs, and she will focus on exactly that. But I mentioned the effects that sitting can have as a starting off point for us in this talk because I believe it creates the notion that as long as you're not sitting, you're fine and everything is okay. Sitting has appropriately been made a culprit for some of the chronic lifestyle diseases prevalent today. And I believe that has been ingrained in our society by statements like, sitting is the new smoking. But even when you look at the recommendations made by the CDC's Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans from 2018, one of the recommendations states that adults should move more and sit less. Don't get me wrong, I believe this is great advice. But while putting this into practice, I believe the average American sees sit less. Okay, I'll stand. And by doing so, the belief is that they are taking care of the issue. This presents two big problems. One, it ignores half the recommendations, that is, move more. And two, standing does not equal sitting less, as I hope to convince you over the next couple of minutes. When you think about occupational standing, you probably think of one of these two scenarios, at least I did, before thinking a little more about it. We have the popular standing desks that the gentleman on the left is standing at. Of course, it doesn't have to be this fancy version, but nonetheless, some sort of standing desk. Or you may think about the old time assembly line production of manufacturing demonstrated in this World War II era photo of women making radios. However, there are still many jobs that require a lot of occupational standing in today's society. We have grocery store workers. There are still many assembly line workers and even things like bank tellers or hotel desk attendants. The point is that there are a lot of people that are required to or have the option to stand for long periods of time while working. The question is, what effect does all this standing have on our bodies? 
What we're looking at here is a flowchart that identifies prolonged standing with the progression of several biological pathways. You can see there are indirect links to cardiovascular issues such as the progression of varicose veins and the reduction in plasma volume as a result of increased hydrostatic pressure in the lower legs. These can influence factors which then have a more direct effect to increase atherosclerosis or heart disease. Of course, this all happens while also experiencing discomfort, particularly in the lower back. And the other thing I want to point out to you is that many of these factors ultimately culminate in an increased physical inactivity, which only serves to further perpetuate the progression of atherosclerosis and heart disease, as well as low back pain. Now let's take a look at some of the data to support these claims. First, let's look at low back pain. This is a major issue as low back pain is one of the top reasons people see their primary care physicians. On the right, you can see one example of several that show co-activation of the glute medius muscle is increased in those who experience low back pain. Further, on the right, you see that those with low back pain also tend to have less hip abduction strength, suggesting that if you strengthen the hip abductors, you can alleviate some of the low back pain associated with prolonged standing. Like low back pain, fatigue and discomfort are also major issues associated with prolonged standing. Here we see the results of two different studies that were investigating general fatigue and discomfort associated with standing. In the tables on the left, you see a perceived discomfort and pain scale on the top. Note that the lower the score, the greater the discomfort, and on the bottom, the perceived discomfort and pain results from both active and passive standing work. In each scenario, subjects were asked to complete a screwdriver-driven task that lasted about 60 minutes. In the active standing condition, the task was conducted at several different workstations that required subjects to occasionally walk from station to station. In the passing standing condition, subjects did the entire screwdriver task at a single station. You can see across the board, the passive standing had lower scores compared to active standing, indicating greater pain and discomfort when subjects were in the passive standing condition. But even the active standing had an overall pain and discomfort score of 7.9, indicating noticeable discomfort. The graph on the right shows results from Antil and colleagues in which 10 young women unaccustomed to occupational standing stood at a desk for 32 minutes. In the graph, you see the discomfort became significantly elevated in the feet and knees after only 12 minutes of standing. Collectively, we see that standing, regardless of whether movement is involved, leads to some level of discomfort in a relatively short period of time. Now let's venture into some data on varicose veins. This table from work conducted by Tushin and colleagues published in 2005. They were looking to assess the relative risk of hospitalizations due to varicose veins in the lower extremities of people that worked in an upright position at least 75% of the time. In other words, they were asking how much more likely are people that stand a lot to be hospitalized for varicose veins compared to those that don't stand that much. What this table is showing is the relative risk of being hospitalized for varicose veins based upon a number of different work, physical, and lifestyle characteristics separated out with data for men on the top and women on the bottom. This table indicates that of all the factors that these researchers explored, working in a standing or walking position had the highest relative risk for hospitalization due to varicose veins in both men and women. Researchers are able to conclude that prolonged standing at work constitutes an excessive risk for hospital treatment due to varicose veins, and standing accounts for more than one-fifth of all varicose vein cases in working age individuals. They recommend that standing or walking at work should be limited and that people should alternate with other positions such as sitting. This graph, also from work done by Antil and colleagues, shows that data support the mechanism behind the development of varicose veins when standing. Again, they had 10 college-age females not accustomed to prolonged occupational standing stand for 32 minutes while collecting data on lower limb blood flow, amongst other things. As you can see, blood flow, assessed by laser Doppler flowmetry, shows that blood flow to the feet and soleus muscles were increased significantly after 24 minutes of standing. The increase in blood flow may contribute to the increase in vascular stress and development of varicose veins. 
Cardiovascular problems are also a concern that may arise as a result of prolonged standing. Here is some data from acute studies that measured cardiovascular response to standing. The two graphs on the lower left are data out of our lab at Montclair State that compared the change in diastolic blood pressure from quiet rest to 15 minutes of seated versus standing computer work. You can see that both the change in diastolic blood pressure and rate pressure product, a marker of cardiovascular or cardiac work or stress, was greater in the standing condition. Further, the graph from Antle et al shows mean arterial pressure becomes significantly elevated after only eight minutes of standing work. Both of these studies were conducted on healthy college age adults with no reported cardiovascular issues and support greater cardiovascular stress in response to acute standing. Prolonged standing can also have chronic effects on the cardiovascular system as demonstrated here. On the left is a graph showing the average four-year change in carotid intima media thickness for individuals from several different levels of occupational standing. Carotid intima media thickness is a measure of the thickness of the inner two layers of the carotid artery, the intima and the media. It is used to diagnose risk for vascular disease. In this figure from Krauss et al., you can see a strong dose-dependent increase in carotid intima media thickness as the level of standing progresses from none, to a little, to quite a lot, and finally very much. This suggests that the longer a person stands at work, the greater the potential for cardiovascular disease. On the right, we see that heart disease incidence, or frequency over a 12-year period, is more than two times greater in people whose primary working posture is standing compared to those who primarily sit. Again, further suggesting a chronic association of cardiovascular disease risk with prolonged occupational standing. So let's review what we've covered to this point. We have seen that, and hopefully I've been able to convince you that, prolonged occupational standing is associated with discomfort in the low back and extremities, an increased incidence of varicose veins, and increased risk for the development of cardiovascular problems. But if you remember back to the objectives of this talk, I am also going to discuss the effect that standing, compared to sitting, can have to support weight loss efforts, which for many, especially those with weight-related problems, may be the main reason for standing in the first place. Let's see what the data says. Here we have several studies that each analyze energy expenditure, metabolic rate, or oxygen consumption while sitting compared to standing. On the top left, Smith et al. determined that energy expenditure was elevated while standing compared to sitting in obese adults, but not in the normal weight counterparts. On the top right, you can see a study completed by Zai and colleagues that studied normal weight college age adults. In that study, the effect that sitting compared to standing had on metabolic rate was dependent upon the task being completed, with quiet standing and standing while filing leading to an increased metabolic rate compared to those tasks while sitting but typing was similar, was similar in both postures. Compare that to the results of a study completed in our lab at Montclair State, showing oxygen consumption was elevated following standing computer work compared to the same activity while sitting. In the graph on the lower right, you see the results of a study completed by fellow speaker, Dr. Barone Gibbs, in which they studied subjects while sitting, transitioning between sitting and standing, and standing alone over three separate 60-minute trials. Their results show a stepwise increase between the three conditions, with standing having the highest caloric expenditure. Collectively, these studies show that there may be some influence of weight or activity on the effect that standing can have on energy expenditure compared to sitting. But despite the significant differences shown here, they are still relatively small in the overall energy expenditure. So the question now is, are these differences enough to have a supportive role to counteract weight gain to further support weight loss in people who are looking for standing to do that? Here we have a study published last year by Betts et al. that was specifically designed to determine the difference in energy cost between sitting and standing. To do this, they carefully monitored metabolic cost of several activities under basal conditions from 46 men and women whose BMI would classify them as either normal or overweight. 
What they determined was that the change in sitting to standing seen in purple on the right of the graph was on average about 0.65 kilojoules per minute, which equates to about 9 kilocalories per hour. These results, which represent an increased ex energy expenditure depending upon body weight of about 35 to 40 kilocalories over a four hour period, are in line with the results of the previously mentioned study from Dr. Barone Gibbs that concluded over a four hour period alternating position between sitting and standing would result in an increased expenditure of about 50 kilocalories depending upon body weight. Betts et al. concluded that the 12% difference in sitting to standing does not likely represent an effective strategy for the treatment of obesity, but could potentially attenuate any continued weight gain. So at present, standing may prevent further weight gain, but does not appear to be able to reverse obesity. Lastly, since occupational standing may prevent further weight gain, let's consider what effect it may have on some other markers associated with weight gain and obesity. This study from McElwain and colleagues looked specifically at office workers with abdominal obesity and the effect that reducing sitting time could have on sedentary behavior and cardiometabolic risk factors associated with obesity. Subjects were randomly assigned into an experimental or control group. The experimental group was provided sit-stand desks and the control group was not. Neither group was provided any specific instructions about changing their behaviors and were asked not to change their diet. The results show that despite a reduction in sedentary behavior at work, the experimental group did not see any changes in any of the cardiometabolic risk factors that the authors monitored. This suggests that increased standing alone may not be enough to stimulate changes in cardiometabolic risk factors, or that office workers need to be better instructed about how to properly, properly use sit-stand desks. If you're interested in the application of sit-stand desks, please watch the presentation given by Dr. April Chambers, as that will be the focus of her talk. So in conclusion, I hope I've been able to convince you that standing alone is associated with several potential negative outcomes, namely low back pain, development of varicose veins, and progression of other cardiovascular impairments. Also, we saw that although energy expenditure may be slightly elevated while standing, the increase alone is likely not enough to have meaningful effect, meaningful effect to reduce obesity or some of its cardiometabolic risk factors. And finally, I'll go back to my first point. Now I think if you're watching this, you probably came in with the belief that most people need to move more. But hopefully you come away with the belief that telling people to sit less may not be specific enough and perhaps be stationary less would be better advice as this recommendation may encourage more than just standing. So thank you all for listening, and thank you to my fellow presenters, Dr. Bethany Barone Gibbs and Dr. April Chambers. Please listen to their talks. I hope you will join us on Friday, November 6, for our roundtable discussion at 10 a.m. And finally, thank you to my current and past graduate students whose names are listed here. And of course, thank you to my fellow collaborators at Montclair State. I hope you enjoyed this talk and check out the Department of Exercise Science and Physical Education at Montclair State University. Again, we are located in the northeast portion of the state, about 12 miles west of New York City. We are very excited about the direction of the school and especially our program. Please reach out to me if you'd like more information on our master's program. My email is listed here. It is hosikp at montclair.edu. Thank you and be well. Bye.